In this week's episode of TechSess, I'm going to be joined by Chris Bain from Alzheimer's Research UK, who are our charity partner for quarter three this year. And they were actually nominated by one of our new customers who is actually doing a charity skydive and they recommended that we also partner with them too. And we've got Alzheimer's Month and World Alzheimer's Day coming up in September. And we'll hear more about that in the episode with Chris. So I'm delighted to be joined by Chris Bain from Alzheimer's Research UK, who's coming here to talk about all the great work that they do as our quarter three charity partner here at M3 Network. So Chris, thanks for joining us. Uh, Thanks very much, Mark. And obviously, thank you for choosing to support Alzheimer's Research UK. Yes, of course, close to my heart. I've been with Alzheimer's Research UK now for just over three years. I came to work with them because my mum, who's literally just next door, is diagnosed with Alzheimer's. She's only 75 and was diagnosed in when she was 67 years old. And that was a obviously a huge shock. And uh, at that time, well, there's still no treatments available, but all I could do rather than just watch her decline was to come and try and do something about it. So I thought I'd come and raise money to, to support and accelerate treatment for a cure into all dementias, actually. Alzheimer's in particular for me as, as mum, that's mum's diagnosis. So yeah, it's a very, very much a cause close to my heart. And, I, and I'm so glad I did because there'd been a tremendous help was obviously to me on my journey with a, a mum who's got Alzheimer's, but it's also great to be you know, at that cold face and understanding what the challenges are, understanding more about the disease, because I didn't know, I didn't know it was a disease really before mum got it. And then understanding what our progress looks like towards finding a cure and the hope that that can then give to people like me and people in the future. Yeah, and it's interesting because most, if not all of the people that I've interviewed from charity partners have some sort of personal connection or a reason as to why they got in touch. It's never really just because, well, I was just looking for a job and that just looked interesting. There's always generally, you know, a personal reason as to to how they got in touch. So thanks for sharing that. And I guess it gives you probably real purpose and kind of what you're doing every day and kind of getting up and feel like you're you're part of trying to solve the problem and actually you actually had a kind of fundraising kind of partnership kind of background already i see from your linkedin were you doing something similar before in a similar yeah role as well i've worked in the charity sector pretty much since for that my whole adult life and for the last 20 years started out I see, I started out beekeeping in Africa or helping a beekeep, volunteering to help a beekeeping association and then ended up going around the world actually working for charities and, and in a partnership and fundraising role. Yeah. One of the questions I was actually going to ask you was, because I've seen that you mentioned that you'd actually kind of worked in lots of different countries and stuff. So I was going to ask, what was your, what was the favorite country that you've worked in? Yeah, it's, it's a question I'm often asked. And uh, yeah, I have to say without doubt, actually Vietnam. It was an incredible country, incredible food. Like the, the food in Vietnam was amazing, but the work was really good. Actually, I've been very proud of what I've done and what we do as Alzheimer's research. But when I look back at, at the, the stuff we were doing there, that was that's some really proud moments for me there. And the, the Vietnamese people are fantastic to work with. Things really get done and get done quickly. And that, yeah. But yeah, people, countryside, food. Vietnam, if I had to choose somewhere that wasn't England to live, it would be Vietnam. And this is probably going to sound really stupid, right? But I'm going to ask it because there might be some other people thinking the same thing. Is that So Alzheimer's, is that exactly the same as dementia? Uh, that's, that's a really good question. And it's one of the, one of the big things we try and, one of the big things we try and do is challenge the misconceptions around dementia. So Dementia is the umbrella term for a set, for a set of symptoms that memory loss, repeating yourself, yeah, those kind of things. But dementia is caused, we know now, by disease. Alzheimer's is the most common disease that causes dementia, and that accounts for roughly two thirds of dementia diagnosis. And then you've got three other three other major types of dementia: that's vascular dementia, frontotemporal dementia, and Lewy body dementia. There are quite a few other sort of more rare more rarer types of dementia, but the four main diseases that cause it are Alzheimer's, Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal and vascular. And yeah, it's not something, as, as I mentioned before, when thinking about my mum, it, it, it is something that I just assumed for a long time that was a natural 
process part of aging, but it, it's not, it's disease. And now we know that as it's a disease, we can cure it. One of our big campaigns three or four years ago, but maybe longer was, I don't know, was with Samuel L. Jackson. You may have seen him. You can look him up on YouTube. Uh, it, was a com- it was a campaign called Share the Orange. Too many of us think dementia is just a natural part of aging and that stopping it is beyond us. We're wrong. So I'm helping Alzheimer's Research UK to set that right. And you can help too. Just share the orange. We worked with Brian Cranston and Christopher Eccleston too. And that was a huge public campaign around around those misconceptions because the orange is weighs about 140 grams and Alzheimer's takes away around about 140 grams of your of your brain, which is about the weight of an orange. So mm-hmm. this campaign of Share the Orange was that kind of physical representation of of what is happening in your brain based upon a disease and therefore Alzheimer's is a disease. And because it's a disease, we know we can cure it as we have done, as we have done, you know, tackling cancer, HIV, COVID-19. Yeah. And so, okay, so I hadn't seen the advert. Of course, I know Samuel Jackson and I'm not going to quote any of his lines because they've all got swear words in them. (laughs) (laughs) And the orange thing. So is that how... Over how long a period of time are you looking for like that to k- kind of be lost within the brain? Well, it's, yeah, from diagnosis to death. And it's, yeah. So the average life expectancy of somebody after a dementia diagnosis, I think, is around 11 years. But it can it can go up to up to 20 years. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, yeah, we've actually got a customer that ha- operates a, a few healthcare facilities in the Lake District. One of them is a specialist dementia care center. So I have seen the effects of this and especially what was quite shocking. I think one of the first times I ever visited was how young some of the people were. I think they had some people that were even kind of in their in their fifties that were already diagnosed and, and clearly suffering from, you know, dementia and things. So so yeah, it's one of these things that like you said, you think, oh, it's something that affects kind of people really older, but yeah, like all these things, there's always the exceptions, isn't there, where you get kind of younger people being affected uh, by these things. Yeah, I mean, the early onset dementia uh, and certain types of dementia, frontotemporal dementia, can can, have, can affect you as early as your 40s. And as I mentioned, mum was 67, which is, yeah, she, way young. I'm not that far off 67 yet <laughs> at the moment, but mm. I say I'm not that far off that at the moment, kind of jokingly, but because mum's had it, because my auntie, mum's sister has had it. It's, you know, something that scares me, scares me. And it is a scary condition to get because we know there's no treatment and the declining quality of life. For people 40 to 50 years old, it is one of the most feared health conditions at the moment. Are men or women more affected than each other? Or what is the kind of stats on that? Yeah, the women are disproportionately affected by dementia. There are a couple of reasons for that. There's more research in some areas that needs to happen, but Principally, yeah, the, the biggest risk factor for dementia is aging. Um, women live longer. Um, the, there's been other things in the news that uh, around uh, HRT and those as, as risk factors. That's that needs more research to be fully understood. But yeah, there there are more women who get dementia diagnosis, but that's principally because of of the age age factor. But it also disproportionately affects women because women are more likely to be carers for somebody with dementia than men. So more likely to take time off work or more likely to not be able to work because they're caring for somebody. We're solely focused on finding a cure. I mean, that's why yeah. we exist for a cure. So we fund research across the UK for that purpose to accelerate our progress towards a cure. And we also will work, we'll fund work or we'll research in prevention, diagnosis, because diagnosis is inadequate at the moment, and then treatment. So the drugs that we need for a cure. And wrapping around that is looking at is is looking at the health system working on advocating for changes in the health system so that when these drugs are proven, that they can be delivered as fast as possible to the patients who who need them. You've maybe actually touched on one of the things I was going to ask, which is diagnosis. So how would someone, would I guess it's maybe not the person themselves that would say, hey, I think I have dementia. Is it more likely to be their close family that think, hey, we should maybe speak to someone? I mean, how does a diagnosis normally come about? That's it. That's, that's normally it. I mean, I, if I take mum, for example, she's very clearly got Alzheimer's because she, she can't do anything for herself anymore, but she'll swear blind that she doesn't. 
and she swore blind that she didn't when we took her for a diagnosis. It took it took about a year to persuade her to go in to see the GP to to discuss it. And that's I know that that's a situation that is not unique to me. It does take a while to get that person to to come around to making the decision to go. It takes the family sometimes a while because you know I remember I remember when my dad said, "Oh, I think your mum's having some," you know. She keeps repeating herself. I think there's something wrong. I said, no, I don't, you know, don't be daft, dad. It's not, since only 67, just, she surprised the button. She still does Pilates and, you know, plays tennis. But yeah, the, so the diagnosis was made, but the diagnosis, the diagnosis is still, it's like a 40 year old process. It's a, like a memory test, a paper based memory test that then shows that, that that person will have cognitive impairment. You can then. And, and then a diagnosis can be made by the doctor as to what kind of dementia the doctor would think it is based upon family history or, or some certain symptoms. But to get an ab- absolutely accurate diagnosis, you have to, you'd have to have a PET scan or a lumbar puncture, which sounds horrible, but it's actually not, it's not such a bad process. But the trouble is with PET scanners is that there are not that many of them in the UK. I think there, are, there's a roundabout. 90, I think 88 PET scanners for the, that serve the whole of the UK. And so you have to be close to one to get that proper diagnosis. Yeah. And then, what uh, does, what, sorry, just interrupt. What, what does that look like? I mean, what is this? What is that equipment? PETs, well, if you imagine a sort of MRI type thing, it's a big, right, okay. it's a big, you know, scanner that sits in its own, its own piece of infrastructure. I can't remember the cost of them off the top of my head, but they cost a lot of money. They cost a lot of it's money too. Expensive. Yeah, yeah, it's expensive. I think we're pretty efficient at using them as a health system. I think probably because we don't have that many of them. So, we, you know, we have to, yeah, that they're, they're in demand, if you like. You mentioned earlier about looking after people, the, the wider family who care for someone with dementia. And you, you're absolutely right that the stresses that, it, that a dementia diagnosis or a di- diagnosis of any disease Terminal disease or otherwise it puts on a family is enormous. But while there's no treatments for dementia, you know, it's like okay, your your mum or your, your father uh, uh, or your wife or your husband has got dementia. And we believe it's Alzheimer's. That's kind of where it stops. Okay, you go home and your family will look after you. Now there are these are some drugs you could take that can potentially uh alleviate some of the symptoms of dementia not change the course of the disease it's still going to happen but you just got to go home and look after that person but with with other diseases you know the family might be sort of coming around a treatment plan or this is you know knowing that this is what's going to happen these are the steps this is your treatment plan for the next year two years this is what you can expect and that's not the case with dementia so it kind of for me personally it feels like it's a disease that sits behind the front door as such it's kind of it's hidden. Um, that we do what we can. You know, we'll, we'll try. We'll try and keep that person who's uh, who's got a dementia diagnosis engaged. Trying to keep that exercise. Trying to keep their mind as active as possible. Now, I'm sure I heard. I was in the car on the radio the other day. Has there been some recent kind of drug news or something? I heard something about this where it can slow down kind of the rate of dementia and things. Am I picking that up right? That you are. So as. Uh, it's been a really exciting week for dementia research. Um, there is a drug that has gone through its phase three clinical trials. There's a conference in the, in the Netherlands this week, the Alzheimer's Association International Conference, where the drug firm, Eli Lilly, they presented the full results of the clinical trials. And it has shown that uh, and it's a, it has a 35% improvement in cognitive function over an 18 month period. I think it's 18 months when it's taken. Now, that might not sound like much, but that is the first, but it's the first, it's the first drug that's proven to have that much effect on cognition. And it's what it's proven is that it is tackling what we know is the cause of the disease. So this is, we, we, we term it as disease modifying treatment, a DMT. And it's the first of, well, the, there have been three that have been released in the past year. The last two have shown good, like good results. That's the first disease modifying treatment of its kind in the 117 years since Alzheimer's was discovered. So wow. this is our tipping point. This is our chemotherapy moment for dementia, if you like. It's proven that we understand how the disease works and that we can create drugs that can stop that process from happening or reduce the effect of that process. Um, 
and that's what we've been that's what we've been looking for for ages that incontrovertible proof that we can develop a drug that tackles this part of the pro this part of the process um and now that's now we've got that proof point that's going to focus uh, that's going to focus research on that um is drug companies are going to realize there's commercial endpoints for drugs that are that are similar to you know oncology drugs and that that means the research dollars in pharma companies will should we expect be you know st- start improving start increasing which is something that we need because you know dementia research has been chronically underfunded for years if if you and your listeners would be kind of want to know what that process is i can explain a little bit more about that disease hypothesis it's the first drug of its kind. It's not, it's not the silver bullet. It's not the cure. It's an amazing proof point. We know it works. We know it's effective. We know it will improve some people's quality of life, but it does, it has the most impact when dementia is detected early, earlier. So we go back to that point about diagnosis until we can improve diagnosis, we're going to be hamstringing the performance of that drug to people with dementia. And as we know from other diseases, it often takes a cocktail of different drugs, different approaches that target different systems to to really find the cure. But it's so exciting. We now know that that cure is within our grasp. Within 10 to 20 years time, there will be treatments that are coming through that will improve people's lives, that will change the outlook of a patient with dementia so that it's not just behind a closed door. So the doctor will be able to say, I can prescribe you this. This is what's going to happen. This is how, how you're likely to improve. The, the interesting point you picked up about the the underfunding and the diagnosis and stuff. So there's an article on the Daily Mail that said dementia cases in the UK are set, set to soar. And they're predicting that, I, I don't know if you can back this up but they were reckoned by, that by 2051 that 2 million people in the UK will be living with dementia by then. They also interestingly showed a map of percentage of population in the UK living with dementia who seems to be around the coast and, and very much kind of down south where there seems to be I don't know if there's any kind of whether you back that up is it does it depend on where people live or it just so happens that there's more elderly people living in those locations or yeah, I, you know, I, I hesitate to make generalizations, but I think certainly in that in that prevalence around the coastal areas, that is because it's a, a, an aging population um, sure. that so lives there's no, there. There's no reason that it's because you live near the sea and like the sea's like you know more polluted, or there's any sort of there's no correlation to kind of anything. Yeah, happening, but you know. it, you'd expect it to be the other way around, living by the sea, because we know that one of the risk factors for dementia is air pollution, and you'd expect a coastal area to be. Well, I always go to the coast for bracing fresh air, right? Well, I mean, that kind of you mentioned earlier covering like what can cause or what can kind of lead to dementia. Does what you've done twenty years ago, you know, does that affect things now in terms of increasing your your risk of these things? Yeah, I mean, you can always do things to uh, to reduce your risk of dementia. You know, when I mentioned that one of the things, one of the areas that we fund research into is prevention, and that has led to our brain health program. So looking after your brain, essentially. And in 2020, we co-funded some research. It was published in the Lancet Journal that identified that there are 12 risk factors for dementia that could be modified by changing the way that you live. And that 40% of dementia cases could be, uh, or dementia diagnosis could be prevented if people addressed these certain modifiable risk factors. Now, there are there's a lot of the usual suspects in there for any disease. Uh, smoking you know, not stopping smoking, reducing alcohol, exercise, uh, t- taking regular exercise, obesity. There are some interesting ones like social isolation as a risk factor for dementia. So being lonely, being not sort of living in, a, in an isolated area. Middle, middle-aged hearing loss is also a risk factor for dementia, which I think we, we are funding research into what the actual link is for that, but we can make an, an assumption, and it's the only assumption that if you've got middle-aged hearing loss and you're not using a hearing aid regularly, then you're potentially kind of causing a little bit of isolation in yourself. So so as a result of that, we've developed a, a nationwide public health campaign called Think Brain Health. So you could go to our website and uh, th- do, do a little check-in, Think Brain Health check-in that will give you not a score, but kind of tips on how to look after your brain better. But we've condensed that into three key messages, which are uh, look after your heart. A healthy heart is a healthy brain. So that's exercise, smoking, alcohol, eating a good diet. You know, we recommend a Mediterranean, a Mediterranean diet as a nice, healthy option. 
then stay sharp, you know, keep that, view your brain as a muscle and keep that exercise, keep it challenged, uh, build up a, sort of a cognitive reserve or cognitive resilience, and then keep connected, um, which is about that isolation. So stay connected to your family, your friends, your communities, do what you can to keep those social connections vibrant and alive. And if you know somebody who's not so connected or is isolated, reach out to them, bring them back into the fold, keep them connected and, and help sort of, you know, reduce their risk of the dementia diagnosis. And if we can, if you can cover those things and, and really look after yourself, then you will reduce the risk of dementia. You go the other with dementia, as with other diseases, there are risk genes that we all carry, but those genes are, are typically activated and, and turn into something like cancer or dementia when those risk factors aren't addressed. Okay. Yeah. And you've maybe answered the next question, which is despite all that, are there some people that will just get it because of genetics? Is it a genetic thing? Is yeah. likely to get it if it's in your family? You know, there is no blame on getting a dementia diagnosis. If you get dementia, it's not necessarily because you haven't looked after your heart or stayed connected or stayed sharp. You know, you have those risk genes. There are genes that, that will cause you to develop dementia. In terms of its kind of hereditariness, there is only, I think, 1% of dementia diagnoses are classified as hereditary. It's not typically something that's handed down. Frontotemporal dementia, you're much, much higher risk of getting of that being handed down. I think that's at 30, that, that shoots up to like 35% of cases are hereditary. But no, there are these risk genes that some of us will carry more of and, and that, would, that would turn into dementia at some point. Talking about money, because obviously we're here to raise funds and, and to yes. support the work that you guys are doing. Give us some ideas of, you know, what does fundraising mean? How is the charity funded? And how, you know, if businesses, other businesses like us, if we are raising some money, what can that money be put towards and how can it help? Well, fundraising is obviously, obviously vitally, vitally important to us because we fund research and, and that research it is at the cutting edge and sometimes in areas of research that companies wouldn't ordinarily be doing because it's risky. But those are the areas where we can, where the, the sort of the magic happens, if you like. But that doesn't, you know, when we say we're researching, it, dementia is a huge disease, a global problem. It, it's it's going to take a lot of money to to move it forward. But, you know, that, that doesn't all come at once. Every Every little, every pound that comes into the pot does good. I mean, one hour of research, for example, costs 20 pounds. So if somebody, a company, an individual was to run a bake sale or donate 20 pounds or, or, you know, get together for a run or a walk and, and you know, fundraise in, in a fun way, uh, 20 pounds will fund one hour of research. Uh, and I always, I've always liked to say that, you know, that one hour could be the magic hour, right? It could be the hour where that discovery happens and that major breakthrough happens. And yeah, and that helps millions of people. I think I've said this a few times that I've spoken to business owners where they think that, you know, if we're not raising a lot of money, then what's the point? Because, you know, they of, often see, you know, like celebrities and stuff will go and swim the channel and raise like £10,000 or £20,000. They think, well, we're not going to do something like that. So what's the point? But the point and the message I keep kind of saying to people, it's, you know, you, you don't understand, like, you raising five hundred pounds here or a thousand pounds from doing some initiative within your business is does actually mean a lot because one, it shows to other businesses that you don't have to go and raise the big kind of, you know, record breaking sums of money and that small amounts do make a difference in charities. So yeah, you've a, got a thousand small amounts is the same as one one big amount. And we love that kind of stuff. We have a network of regional fundraisers that are happy to go into businesses and uh, yeah, help with those ideas. It could just be, yeah, as I say, it could be a simple lunch and learn where we could come in and talk about dementia. But, uh, you know, we spoke about stats and prevalence earlier, and we know that, well, our sort of our latest, our most up-to-date stat is that if nothing changes now, then one in two of us is going to be affected by dementia, either by caring for someone with dementia, by a dementia diagnosis, or unfortunately through both. So that's, you know, that's half of people, that's half of the small businesses workforce and uh, half of the workforce in a small business is a, is a sizable chunk. So it is a cause that, you know, more and more people are aware of dementia, aware of know somebody with dementia. And it's, a, I think it's a cause that's really resonating with a lot of people. Yeah, sure. And 
one thing I want to point out is that you know you guys are like really up to date because on your website when you're when you have the option to, to, to donate directly, you can actually donate via cryptocurrency. That's the first time I've seen I think seen a charity with a donate via cryptocurrency there. So if anyone's got any Dogecoin lying around that they they want to donate, then then please go and do that. But yeah, I just started pointing that out because it's the first time I've ever seen a charity with that. So yeah, you guys are bang up to date with all the, the modern ways for people to donate. <laughs> yeah, that's I think that's been fairly recently, I see. But yeah, no, we're a we're an innovative, groundbreaking organization, of course. <laughs> well, absolutely. <laughs> I shared a post recently announcing obviously you guys as the charity partner and I included all the kind of social media links and stuff in there. I always ask people kind of what is what's the best way for people to kind of either get in touch or to find out more about what you guys do? Well, obviously visit our website. Uh, I mentioned the Think, Think Brain Health check-in before. That's a great way to sort of, you know, get that information. But our website is, is our first point of contact. If you're a small business or a business who wants to get in contact, you can email us at, uh, I think it's corporate at Alzheimer's Research UK, but all, or, or email me directly. That's fine. But yeah, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn. That's where, you know, that's it's been a super vibrant feed this recent week because we've been pushing forward all the announcements from the conference I made around the drugs and new things around blood-based biomarkers as a diagnosis method. But yeah, and there's, yeah. Loads of ways to get in touch. You guys have actually got probably more social channels than what I've seen from a lot of charities as well. So you guys are obviously got a good social media team and people in the ball there. So uh, we're, we're, we're very amazing. much, sorry, we're very much breaking and not breaking into, but uh, yeah, so they, with the Twitch, the Twitching community, to call them the Twitchers. <laughs> well, they, they're, they're not they're not bad watchers anymore, but the Twitch, the streaming community, is being super yeah. supportive of us, and that, that's yeah, that's great too. Thanks so much for your time, Chris. It's been good chatting with you. I've certainly learned a lot, and I'm sure people will learn a lot from this too. And yeah, go and check out the website. It's a great website. There's loads of stuff on there. Actually, it's one of those sites you go, oh, I'll have a look at that, and you start reading, and then before you know it, it's like. You know, spent like half an hour, 45 minutes just sitting reading about stuff and really exciting that there's this new news about kind of new groundbreaking drugs. Great timing as well. And also the last thing I was going to mention, which I think I mentioned in the post, is September is World Alzheimer's Month, isn't it? And then there's, there's World Alzheimer's Day. I'm going to really impress you here. And remember, it's the 21st. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 21st of September. So this is really good timing to kind of for us at M3 to kind of promote this as well and to have you guys as our charity partner and um, can't wait to see what our customers help us raise by the end of the quarter. So end of September, we'll kind of round that up and find out what we're going to be sending your way to help fund future research and things and see what else you guys are going to do. So, so thanks very much again, Chris, and appreciate your time. Because so, I mean, I would just say before I go, if I may, that there, that there has honestly never been a more positive or more exciting time to support dementia research, and and you guys are, are right there at the start of this momentous journey towards a cure. You know, when I started working for Alzheimer's Research three years ago, the hope was there, the hope was eternal, but it wasn't attached to any like major news like this. And when you think about supporting it, research. Sometimes that's like, well, that's just money into research. We don't know what the end point is, but we do know there's an end point. We do know we can make this change for the the million people who've got a dementia diagnosis in the UK and, and though well, certainly those in the future. So yeah, it's a super exciting time. I'm so glad you're on board and so glad you're supporting us. And you know, you're you're part of this movement towards a cure, which is the one thing that we've all been searching for. So, you know, from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for your support. I hope, I hope we smash it. Thank you.